Good morning, watchers. Welcome to Brother Sal's Sunday Gathering at the Storehouse. So happy to have you here listening. And I'm really pleased to be here. Got Tony with me today. Good morning, Tony. Morning, Dad. And uh, I think today the topic's got to be uh, U.S. policy, Iran, and uh, ISIS. The um, Half the world is going crazy over the fact that they made a deal with Iran. <laughs> Most people are thinking that uh, the president's gone wacko and they're uh, probably going to mount some kind of charge in Congress to um, stop it, but I doubt that. I think they got exactly what they wanted. What do you think, Tom? Well, yeah, you know that the people paying for it right now are getting what they want, or at least they're, they're pushing it forward into their direction they're they're not getting any setbacks when you look at it there look at what's going on with greece and the power of the central banks to pull that country right back under their thumb uh like we were saying a couple of weeks ago that's what i was anticipating that either way the greek people are screwed you know they <laughs> In the, in the days of America, you know, 50, 60, 70 years ago, I should say in the days of the, the mafia, when so many of our ancestors were running wild, uh, you know, you, you didn't just take out loans from the loan shark and then say, well, sorry, it didn't work out, I can't pay. <laughs> Those were unfair loans anyway. I mean, of course they were unfair loans. The loan sharks in business to do that. You took them, whether you like it or not, whether you can blame it on a predecessor or coercion or what's the difference. We're at this stage of the game now. You know, what are we going to go back and unravel history? Why don't we give the, you know, North America back to the Native Americans who were living here? Why don't we give Hawaii back to the Hawaiians? Why don't we give Australia back to the aboriginals when you know where do we stop unwinding all this problem the the problem today for Greece is uh, you did spend the money you took the money you spent the money and now you know we're going to hold you to the deal so yeah you want to go sign everything off to Russia or whatever and pay us or do you want to keep it a little easier on yourself and and roll with the current program and so yeah so more austerity i mean that's what happens to the people that's the whole point of the whole game so yeah they're on target because the world's at war and austerity is being put on the people you know bankers aren't going to jail you know rothschilds aren't being arrested around the world and stuff like that you know, the Vatican's not being marched on by all the people of the world to disrupt this one world order that they got going. So, yeah, things are on target in the, in the um, I suppose, the, the most militaristic sense that they are still moving toward their goal. Nothing has stopped that. But in the day-by-day -day sense, you know, I, I don't think they've got it down exactly. They're playing within a framework of a world of people. And, you know, uh, they can't control every, every variable. And so, but I believe they are controlling things like the Russian, the decisions behind Russia and China. Iran appears to be, I, I'm really starting to see that the reason this war comes down, this third world war, is because there is a group of Muslims <laughs> that still aren't sold out. There's still a, a group of people who are theocratic or at least are under the impression that they're theocratic and they have to be won over. They've been 1400 years following these prophecies, waiting for their imam and etc. cetera. Um, they have to be satisfied or, or killed. And so I think that's what's really being set up. And it's not that these governments are necessarily uh, 
kosher, if you will, but a lot of the people that they're leading, Iran, for instance, the Iranian revolution, you know, ever since then, even if it's been set up to be that way, it has in fact been the, um, you know, the, the one horn that stands in that region that can't be toppled simply or at least on the surface, it doesn't appear to be that way. And so they lead that whole Shia sect. One of the articles I was reading out of the propaganda magazines had um, saying about this Iran deal, that what they've done is they're playing ball now to get a big part of the, the new world, basically. So that they, because the alternative is essentially war, is the way everybody's trying to present it. They either have to play along or they have to go to war. And so they've decided to play along at this stage, which would seem to mean, from our perspective, um, giving up Bashar Assad's regime, giving up Syria for some promise they're getting about Shiite rule or you know are they participating in the shia sunni civil war to come out on the other end of it i don't know but that's what it appears we're trying to create and you would think they can't be unaware of that so if indeed this whole process with iran has been you know are we going to go to war now over this or are you going to back off and the sanctions were to put him in a position of having to negotiate, having to let all their people be under a, a, um, a burden so that they could all feel the reality of fighting the West. It means sanctions. It means no money. It means everybody's going broke. Nobody's kids are going to school, you know, unrest and and possible, uh, you know, civil uh, extremism in whatever ways that goes on in Iran. People wanting to change things. And so that's been going on now for a while over there. And so Iran's, you know, it's never been about nuclear weapons. That's ridiculous. Um, you don't need to have all these sanctions and such over nuclear weapons. That's not what's at issue. They're not threatened to send nuclear weapons at, against enemies that have 10 times as many nuclear weapons and can, you know, wipe Iran off the face of the earth, who have an intelligence system and an, you know, early warning system on launches and all that kind of stuff. I mean, nobody can launch an attack against America or, or Israel and and not have it go bad for them. I think everybody knows that. It's a matter of central banking. See, the only people in the world that aren't on the central banking is China, Russia, Iran, Syria, Venezuela. You know, these are the countries that now are, are terrorist nations that we're against. And you know, look deeper in the prophetic view that we're trying to look at. You know, I'm still trying to see, always look toward revelation and what it says comes out of this. What it says comes out of this is Armageddon, world war. Uh, the Islamic eschatology has the sacrifice of the Muslims. The Judaic eschatology has the killing uh, down almost to a man. If the days were not shortened, there'd be none of that race left to save. So somehow what is transpiring gets us from here to there. So Iran can't become an accomplice. They must always remain on that other side. Somebody's got to fight in that final battle. They can't all be on the same side or they can't be a final battle. So right now it would seem that Iran has to keep being set up as the Shia force. If you're going to have a Shia Sunni civil war, somebody's got to support the Shias and somebody's got to support the Sunnis. Well, the Sunnis have plenty of support 
through all the NATO states, right? Those are all Sunni strongholds. And the Shias are the ones who are running for their life right now because ISIS happens to be a Sunni creation. And so that sets up this, as I said a week or two ago, what we know must be a coming predicament where Israel feels threatened for their life and the Shias are either already at war with the Sunnis or they're now feeling, feeling threatened for their life, which is why you have this Sunni-Shia war that's inevitable. Um, and, and you have this moment in time when it seems like things can get totally out of control over there and Israel, among other moderate countries like Jordan and places like this can be completely disrupted over this. And that's why the world's going to have to answer. And as we've been anticipating, the answer seems to be that it's going to come through Jordan, the moderate king who already is the beneficiary of a free trade agreement with the West of, of const, you know, aid second only to Israel uh, in that area of the world, arms and, and intelligence aid. So they are the natural arm. Uh, we do it through Saudi Arabia covertly, but Jordan's the natural arm overtly for us to work through. Used to be Egypt also, but Egypt now has been uh, set into chaos as part of this whole scene because you can't have these strong governments that wouldn't allow ISIS to be able to get into their territory. But with all this disruption, what you find is the extremists being able to gain a foothold in these places. And then if you imagine that there's a tremendous amount of money and funding behind their cause in these places, it's not hard to see why they're spreading so fast. If the money and funding were coming in to some, somebody who was anti-ISIS, well, then they, they wouldn't be able to spread so fast. But we know from a lot of the insight now into that world that, no, the funding's coming through the Saudi Arabians and, and the, now over in Libya, which we, we toppled, so that this could be possible, so that the extremists forces could rise up and money could get funneled. Uh, so that's what, you know, I'm looking at it from the standpoint that this all does have to build. You know, we, I, I read a little bit of the, you know, propaganda stuff. The U.S. economy is doing good uh, again because the, you know, amount of people filing for unemployment is down. You know, no talk of this tremendous bubble in the, in the, uh, schooling system, you know, kids, they're having to refinance people's um, school loans because they can't pay them. There's, there's no work to come out to. And, you know, that kind of stuff get, gets buried. But it's a tremendous, you know, they're obviously not filing for unemployment yet. They're filing for some sort of loan refinance because they, they can't get a job and pay off their loans. So that's just one thing. Uh, but when you look at the whole picture being presented on the mainstream propaganda news, uh, you've got what a serious thing, ISIS, Syria with the chemical weapons. These people are have to be stopped. They're growing. Their strength is growing. You know, it's very few people out there really are listening to us in, you know, in the big picture, but it just so happens that you can go back several months and see that I've been projecting all this because they were such an insignificant and impotent force when we were first introduced to them when we were in our period of, uh, what was it, strategic um, um, contemplation? or no, we, were, we were strategically not taking any action. Yeah. strategic inaction you know and that was obvious that we, okay well we're doing this so that ISIS can gain some foothold whether we were we didn't 
all the information hadn't come out that we were actually funding them, you know, that it's that they're using our weaponry now and we're funding them and all this kind of stuff. But you could tell that we certainly weren't trying to stop them. And I was saying that we certainly do have the capability to stop them and the interest to know what's going on over there and that capability to know because of all of our of our intelligence technology going on in that part of the world. Not to mention we've been at war over there since, you know, 03. So we got a lot of interest in this this sudden extremist group. I mean, if what we're fighting is terrorism and these guys are some extremist terrorists and they're they got some sort of momentum and rising up, well, it's, then it's within our scope to know about them, do something about them. So I knew then that whatever's going on with them, our intelligence industry is well aware. And if we have to send in a couple of deadly uh, choppers or SEAL teams, we could always do that. And if we don't, it's because this is the instrument by which we are moving things along. So I, I'm hoping people are getting that now that are listening to us. My opinion anyway is that it's, it's, it, well, it's more than my opinion. There's a lot of people out there that feel this way, but it seems to be coming more and more um, reliable. Well, it's becoming evident. Yes, that we're providing the means now and we're, we're in fact aiding this ISIS in growing and so you got to ask why? What's the purpose? You know, I mean, some stuff's come out now. It looks that not all of their uh, executions have been um, valid. I mean, not that they're not killing people, but w it, it, some people appear to have poked many holes now in a lot of their, just like the Ebola thing. I mean, if you've seen some of the stuff they put on the news about Ebola to show people supposedly in their final throes of the disease and, and then you have real doctors looking at these videos going well that's you know this person obviously is not sick and that kind of thing so you got a whole bunch of Hollywood and wag the dog going on out there so how much of these executions are to scare us and they certainly want us to think and I've been saying this for months they want us to think what bad people these are that these are ext true extremists that are really a threat now, I've been saying that, and so here we are. They are a bigger threat, a bigger threat, a bigger threat. Well, that's obviously playing into our hands because we're still only talking about them. We're not really doing anything about it. And so now tie that into what's going on with Iran and Syria. It seems to me what I'm looking for is we've told Iran or we're, we're setting up that we're not going to give Iran a cause to have to come after us by officially going into Syria, we're going to let ISIS do it. Because see, what we're really after, it would appear, and it's the opinion of this well-recognized Islamic eschatologist, that what the West is after, what the Zionists are after, is a Shiite-Sunni civil war. That gives the United Nations the obligation even to go in there and do something about it and get some guns set up in all these regions and set up these puppet governments or support the movements for the governments that that will then be puppet governments because they'll be the ones that were supported by the the Zionist Western you know central banking alliance um, that can go in there now and I mean who who knows what they tell us over the TV who they're killing and who they're not killing and for what reasons. You know, this whole thing to me is very... I read another thing about the battle over Mosul because that's an ancient... I mean, if that was so important, we would have never let them take Mosul. <laughs> and now we act as if this is where the line and the sand is going to eventually be drawn. See, we're setting up for all these big eventual... Um, uh, battles and I, I watched another thing from January of 2015 on the battle against ISIS where this was a CNN report uh, where they were it was pointing out that you know this is not going to be months this is going to be years these guys keep changing their tactics on us I mean how's that 
I mean, to know that we've spent this money in military industrial complex, you can't you can't hide for you notice there's no bank robberies anymore. Why you can't hide? <laughs> they can track down the they can read the cover of a cigarette pack from space. You know, all my life. But son of a gun, these ISIS boy, they're, they're pulling different tactical maneuvers that we're just unaware of. We've never seen anything like, ooh, these guys are just mind-blowing over there. The way they, they're, they're, they're just, we can't, we can't get a grip on them. This is going to take years, you know. Isn't that interesting that to, to imagine swallowing the idea that our military industrial complex, our shadow government, our spying that's gone on for you know a generation now that's so deeply rooted that the spies don't even know who they work for um, and yet you're telling me that when these guys were just a small band a few hundred uh, I mean, a, a few hundred people a few months ago a few thousand so what three thousand three thousand that we can oh they're changing their tactics boy what a, what they're going from hopscotch to tiddlywinks i mean we can't keep track they're going from am radio to fm radio like what have they got that we can't you know because funny when you read these articles when you watch this cnn stuff they don't tell you what kind of high-tech tactics they're pulling on us they don't tell you what they're doing that we can't keep up with no examples there just just these Soundbite headlines, ISIS, big threat, change tactics, battling on several fronts, not going to be something we can handle in months but years. This is CNN's take from now going on seven months ago. And what's happened all this time? Have we, have we got a grip on how we're going to take these people out? Oh, no, it just keeps getting worse for us. ISIS keeps growing and we just keep shaking our heads. We just keep getting outsmarted or or outmaneuvered or the political situation is such that we can't get boots on the ground because we got too many conflicting. So we're just going to allow all this years of war that we've been doing in this territory to just be undermined by this group of rebels because whatever excuses, tactical political, you know, geographic, whatever it is. We didn't allow that to stop us, did we, in 03? Boy, it was all-out war, and we've been, you know, we marched through these countries. We took out Saddam's regime. We took out Afghanistan. We, you know, we, set our, we started building the largest military bases in the world. You know, all these things have been going on for a dozen years over there. And yet I'm supposed to believe that this band of rebels has just taken over and marched throughout the whole Middle East. And now there's just nothing we can do. We got too much red tape. We got too, you know, they're tactically too superior to us with their guerrilla warfare. That we just didn't, we just can't figure out a tactic. We can't, man, we cannot outmaneuver these guys. And yet with all of this war that's going on, practically all over the world or at war with somebody or threatening war with somebody. What is the most important thing that they're talking about in the news right now? Um, and what's the Pope of Rome most interested in right now is becoming the uh, czar for, uh, <laughs> for global warming. Like, that's the most important thing that's going on on the planet right now. We're talking about wars that are important. Yeah. Uh, where they're leading the country and the world. Well, and the cost of them in human life and economic terms and the geography and destroying the old world and all the horrible burden right now on the Western world, especially this NATO world, to me, to keep up some... Um, the scheme of, of imagining that the, that anything good comes out of this, that this to keep selling us that this is something that has this war on terror that has to be done. Meanwhile, as you say, that's not in the front pages of the newspapers right now as such. I mean, yeah, well, ISIS is horrible. 
nothing we can do. But meanwhile, yeah, what's the Pope talking about? What's he coming here for in September? Global warming, November in Paris, you know, the whole world right now. And what's the glo the, the Pope, what was he out? Um, what's he been, what's his, this platform that got leaked for September? That they need a, a, a universal political arm to save the world from from catastrophe, the physical world, not not just the world. Of, you know, and, and what's interesting, I'm sure that the Pope in there mentions the wars, but this whole idea, of course, is that we have to stop these terrorists to stop the wars. You know, it's, it's been the same thing since World War II ended. More war to get to peace. To get to peace, we got to keep stopping all the people who don't want peace. And what's so interesting is how those people keep winding up with all these military weapons. You know, where do they get them? How come we don't? But they almost seem like they're free, like they have a pickup station where they can go pick up all the weapons that they want. Well, to this start is, fighting. well, here you are. This is the truth. They are free because the bankers that are behind it all are happy to keep indebting these nations by borrowing money to build weapons. They don't even borrow the money. They just sign away on the weapons and the money is borrowed. Mm -hmm. You know, it goes on to their credit line that their people now owe. So yeah, the best thing that could happen is that everybody wants weapons. And that's what's so interesting that for a hundred years of the United Nations and all these sort of things, NATO, that everybody doesn't vote to keep a, a particular cache of, of potent weaponry uh, in the hands simply of a NATO alliance with no particular country like the U.S. or anybody else having any veto power. No, you have a, an alliance of all the nations of the world, essentially, and they all collectively now have a small, the, the only group of weapons that are allowed sort of what they're trying to go to, but they want the central bankers to have their finger on the button. But theoretically, if all the nations of the world had their finger on the only button that could be pushed, well, then there would be no competition. There'd be no need for it. Because as soon as any one nation said, well, I think we should have weapons also, the group of nations would say, well, no, we've agreed. We've only got one set of weapons and you have a say in when they're used and they're never used except to say no you don't get to have weapons either so that would be a pretty easy way to stop all the people from having weapons and the money being spent on that you know you, you just don't let anybody develop them you know so it goes back to well who gets to have that say well the same people that have that say the winners you know they won world war ii and they said, this is what we're going to do, but it didn't result in that, did it? It resulted in the world having war after war after war, conflict after conflict, and the weapons escalating to the point where it's, it's sort of absurd. Now you have to have these laws where, okay, the public can't have automatic military-grade weapons, right? That's how much military-grade weapons are now in the world that everybody in the public shooting each other with them you know so you have to start having laws to limit the actual you know general secular public from from going down to their normal uh you know weapon store and instead of buying a shotgun to shoot a duck or a rifle to shoot a deer or a pistol to shoot each other in the good old-fashioned sense no you can go buy a you know laser guided uh, uh, rocket launcher to shoot at your neighbor. Uh, so the pl pl proliferation of military weapons, you know, who's, who's responsible? Why is that? You know, well, because you can trace it back. There's groups of people who had their, you know, who were on those committees. And see, so when you go back and you realize that it comes down to the fact that behind those committees, were the same people that funded Hitler and funded the Allies, that funded Stalin as well as the rebuilding efforts in Germany. See, funded the Christian nation, so-called, as well as the 
atheist nation, so-called. So when you do your history and you see that behind all this is money funding the same thing, well, now you can start to get behind why war is always the answer. Peace is always what they talk about in the tabloids because that's the antithesis. Thesis, antith antithesis. You, you need them both going on. You need to own the competition. The best way to beat the competition is to own it. So if you're going to have constant war, you need to constantly be talking about peace so that you can always be just around the corner. If we could just kill this one more guy. But look, he just keeps doing this and that. Don't anybody ask, why does he keep doing this and that? Well, you get the surface answer. Because he don't want peace. No, but wait a minute. Where does he get the money from? To get the guns to, to, to support his not want peace platform. Who supported that? You know? Why is he able to form a not, not want peace platform? How come all the money in the world isn't behind the, no, we won't support your militant platform? How come there's so much money to support militant platforms? Where does it all come from? All these workers who are out of work? I mean, I remember during the Cold War, I mean, we broke Russia, right? And then the wall came down and what happened? The oligarchs went in there and sold out all the Russian people's goods. I mean, that was the story we got through all of our supposed journalism through the 90s was showing us how they fleeced Russia of all of its money and the people were starving over there in the cold and right mm -hmm. well how'd they build up such a potent military now 20 years later they got they got more, more high-tech weapon than we do what well who gave them the money for that wait a minute they were dead broke when I you know 20 years ago we broke Russia we broke them down to nothing where are all their taxpayer money that they're buying these weapons with? <laughs> their taxpayers were starving in the winter and broke in the summer. <laughs> their oligarchs had stolen it, just like our country looks today, kind of. <clears throat> Even worse, if you would have believed the journalism of 20 years ago, Russia was in much worse straits than America was today. So where's America getting all the money to fund these wars? Who's working? We're I mean... Broke. Well, I mean, not only are we broke, but we talk about not being able to keep funding Social Security and Medicare, all these welfare programs, which while we talk about not being able to fund them, we are still funding them. There's still all this money going toward, you know, food stamps and people who can't afford food, toward housing and people who can't afford housing, toward old people who can't afford to live, toward... All these welfare things that we say we can't afford, governments who are just keep spending into debt, state governments, local governments, federal government, they keep spending into debt. Why? Well, because there isn't enough tax money to cover the money they're already committed to, including their military. So where is this money coming from? Oh, well, we know in our country, Federal Reserve, we print it. Go back and watch Greenspan a few years ago when they asked him, well, what about hyper? What about all of a sudden when it crashes because the money's not there? He said, well, in our system, we'll never face that because we can always just print as much money as we need. <laughs> okay, so, <laughs> whoops. Yeah, meaning, you know, every, every, every dollar you keep printing devalues the dollars you already have out there. <clears throat> but the point being that the weapons keep coming from the loans that keep coming from the central banks who print money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, well, it's all based on credit. So well, we're happy to give these countries credit. And, uh, and then we show them where they have to buy weapons with that money. They can't spend it on infrastructure or the people. Well, the whole point is, yeah, it's not a... They're not cash loans. They're digital loans. Yes. They're this many hundreds of billions goes... Now that your country owes me for all these weapons so you can go fight your enemies who I'm giving weapons to on the other side. So I'm loaning money if they want it to buy weapons to fight you, right? That kind of thing. So it's, it's that sort of setup coming down and they really are engineering, as they did World War II, they're engineering World War III. 
And it's got to be a world war. There's got to be a reason for everybody to fight. And so that's what we're watching as it as all the players on the stage are being sort of paid to play their parts, which of course all the people of these countries don't know anything. Many of the probably political figures and people that run institutions and such don't necessarily know what's going on at the inner circle of the plans. They're just, you know, they're told there's a communist threat. There's, they're told there's an atheist threat. They're told there's a terrorist threat. They're shown videos of terrorists mowing people down, cutting people's heads off, and they believe now they're in on the inside information. You know, that's why they're dedicated and committed. i got to do something about this. All these naysayers out there, they haven't seen the stuff I've seen, right? I mean, I imagine that's how a lot of insiders are motivated, which is why they can show up at interviews and, and seem to be, you know, reasonably... Um, honest in their assessment. They seem to be doing what they think they're supposed to do. That doesn't go for most politicians. They're, they're full of it. But when you talk about climate scientists and these other people, they've been shown a certain set of data. And they say, yeah, you, you know, this is what's going on. You know, so if you show a guy a radiation reading and say this radiation reading came from that fish, well, he's going to tell you that fish is poison, and if you eat it, you're in trouble. Now, I can create a whole bunch of hype out of that. Now, how do I know that fish had that radiation reading? It depends. If I'm the scientist that took the reading, but what if I'm just the guy that got given the data? I can only go by the data, see? So I think a lot of what goes on in the world can be, you know, can be looked at reasonably that way. That's why most of us are doing the best that we've got based on the data that we've got. Now, when you get to American politicians and such, they know quite well they've sold out. Most of them don't want to know what the data is. Ignorance is bliss. Don't tell me what the, you know, what the result of my action is. That you don't want. I don't want to know. You don't even want me to know. Of course not. You just tell me it's good. Hey, you signed this bill. Yeah, you've heard about the mercury poisoning. Yeah, you've heard about the fallout over here. But trust me, if we don't do it like this, it's worse if we do it another way. So the politician says, well, you know, you're the guy paying the bills. I trust you. I don't need to know the details necessarily on these things. And probably a lot of them don't. Does that mean they don't know that they're making... Um, unethical decisions. No, I'm sure they do. I'm sure they do. But do they know exactly what those unethical decisions amount to? Probably not. Probably a lot of them couldn't understand it if they were told. So it's the people behind the str strings, that the, the string pullers. They're the ones that ultimately provide the central banking okay because all the debts go back there. That's where you got to get the loan to buy the military equipment. And so, you know, if you don't see that sort of attachment to things and you, you still want to read the world on a surface level of what it says countries do, of what it says politicians, what's the Red Cross doing? Who set up the Red Cross? Who ultimately... Who sits at the top of the Red Cross and who do they answer to? I mean, that's who you'd have to know to know why the Red Cross does what it does or the United Way or any of these other seemingly philanthropic organizations. You know, it's funny when you go back in time and see how people like, you know, an atheist like Carnegie you know, starts these philanthropic organizations, uh, industrialists like Rockefeller are behind these sort of philanthropic organizations, people who have already shown their hand in their industrial dealings as being very unethical and immoral, and yet they start these philanthropic organizations. And again, you can go back in history, John Taylor Gatto does a great explanation of all these things. You know, this is the wolf in sheep's clothing. This is the whole Fabian thing. This is how they kill you with kindness. What's Revela I mean, what's Daniel say? Through peace he shall destroy many. 
interesting, I've noted, how in the last 10 years or more, 15 years more, maybe, we've been involved in the peace process in the Middle East, right? Mm -hmm. The peace pro, which you would think on the, if you had the guns and the manpower, the NATO, the, the sort of world pressure to put sanctions on countries, et cetera, et cetera, and you had decided on a peace process, you'd think you'd be ashamed to find out 15, 20 years later that the result of all your resources, all your power, had been that the peace process resulted in millions of deaths and un unequaled war, unending war and rumors of war. That's what the result of all your effort. I mean, if you were to look back and say, geez, how's those people that have been in, you know, have had the most uh, resources, the most say, the most responsibility and authority in the peace process, how, how, did, how have they done? How are we doing? How's the peace process going? So it's, you know, these sort of things you, you learn as one of my favorite economic uh, dystopic forecasters is always saying, you know, in the mainstream media, when it comes to economy, when they say jobs are on the rise, it means jobs are on the fall. When they say economy's looking up, it means things the economy's looking down. When they say, you know, unemployment, you know, things are getting better, you know, things are getting worse. Why? Just because they're uh, liars? Well, no, because of the track record, because of history. Because every time they come out and start saying these things, the track record shows that it's always the opposite result that follows. You know, it was Greenspan out there telling us that derivatives were perfectly um, stable and they saw nothing unstable in the market whatsoever you know this was just months before the entire world collapsed in 08 you know this is our Federal Reserve Chairman that you know I mean come on what kind of absurdities are these but we don't replay those see on our economic news we keep getting spoon-fed our propaganda and so we forget that seven eight years ago a few of the very insightful eco economists in America were saying, hey, you know, we're, this, we are doomed. These derivatives are completely unstable. This market is going to blow up. This housing bubble is ridiculous. We're, you know, most of the loans are going to people that hardly even have a job, let alone money to buy a house. You know, they're saying this for the two, three years leading up to it. And then that final year, when, the, when, when there's a chorus of, of reliable economists pointing out the actual position you know here's our mouthpieces in Congress here's our mouthpieces at the Fed here's our mouthpieces saying everything's okay how come we're not paying any attention to that now and seeing a replay the same economists who were warning us eight years ago are warning us again today they were right happens to be eight years ago and the people that were telling calling them naysayers who are the official propagandists who are telling us everything's okay we're saying that eight years ago and how did it turn out people you know so so this is the sort of thing i'm trying to point out you can see a similar thing going on with with military buildup and and the sort of wars and rumors of wars mm -hmm. I was going to say, now let's take a look at how all of these things that have been going on for all these years are playing right into the end time scenario that comes us through us through the prophecies. Even to the point now where a Jesuit Pope is getting ready to become the czar of the green religion. I, I can barely believe that. I, I well, really you had a to... hard time when I read that. I said, holy smokes, look what, look what he's doing. Setting himself up to be the false prophet. Well, it, because why? I mean, if you want to talk about the, the prophecies now, you, you're, you know, you've got to span all of this end time prophecy. When you talk about the Pope and global warming and all that, of course, that's part of this agenda for depopulation. You know, the Rosetta Stone put up, I mean, the Rosetta Stone, the, the um, Georgia Guidestone put up by the Rosicrucians. Mm -hmm. You know, 
a uh, sect of the Catholic Church, and they put up these guide stones that say maintain the population at 500 million, like they know that the population some, at some time in the future is going to be depopulated. Where do they get that from, I wonder? Well, Revelation seems to indicate that what? What has someone calculated? Seven eighths, eight ninths, something like that. Um, that that's the kind of depopulation you're going to see. I think that I think it's it's quite straightforward in in a lot of um, different apocalyptic stuff. That seventy five percent seems to be you know one in one in four it seems to be other. So so if you look at it on the standpoint of what did all the ancients predict and know? Well, they seem to know that the cataclysm was only going to leave ten or twenty percent of the people. So. These folks, when we talk about the Pope and the, you know all this Agenda 21 and the climate control or, or global warming that leads to this need for, for control of population, control of, of greenhouse gases and carbon emissions and all this kind of stuff, this is ways of putting in to, um, well, what is the Pope saying, you know, right out of his own mouth? What we need is a universal political force to enforce this. So this is what it does. To save Mother Earth. I mean, those are what. That's how he said it too. Yeah, but he's all, but but that's all part of the. Yeah, of course. You know what's wrong with that? If you don't have a Mother Earth, you don't have any of God's children on it. So none of that is is. Uh, that's the whole thing. All the fear mongers out there try and make everything a scare tactic but when you look at it from their point of view of course they know who their detractors are and they're trying to put it in as reasonable a terminology as they can they're not saying we we're gonna kill everybody to save mother Earth. that's not what the pope's saying it's just that knowing that that's what comes about after their war they're all what I see them doing is already putting into place a structure that is going to be their post-war structure, one in which they've already divided up the world into zones, zones they're going to rebuild the forests, zones they're going to allow to rebuild glaciers or whatever, and and so all of this is just the prelude to putting in place the necessary infrastructure, which is why I also see that it's years down the road, that what they're looking at is a 10 or 20 year plan from now. But the thing is, is that I don't believe their plan comes to fruition. So something between now and that time cuts it off. Well, that's the point. But the point of prophecy is in the, is, is, takes us in a time during their plan. We catch up with them during their plan at a time when they, when a, a, apparently whoever this final ruler of the last three and a half years is says, you all got to take my mark if you want to buy and sell. Whoever this final ruler is, uh, has a prophet that's able to call fire down from heaven. Whoever this final ruler is, is able to result in um, biological warfare or other types of warfare that annihilate hundreds of millions of people on the earth. So all of those infrastructures have to be in place before their plan can even be interrupted in the way that Scripture tells us. Mm -hmm. And so what, we, what we're seeing now is something that's never been seen before, and that is a world make, made so small that the idea of seven-eighths of its population being reduced actually becomes a pragmatic realization on the surface of their, of their plan. Right, and they have a couple of things going for them. They've got like Jonathan Kahn saying that this world is going to crash financially and you have to blame it on God because God said that that's what he was going to do when that's not so. And then you have uh, uh, the rest of the world cooperating uh, right down to the smallest detail to, to make the prophecies come out uh, the way that the, 
the scripture says they're going to come out. And so to me, I say there really isn't anything to worry about because if there was, if they were doing things uh, that put them and their plans in jeopardy, uh, they wouldn't be doing them because they're, they never have. They always do things that further their plan, not put it in jeopardy. I totally agree. And that's why I think even this, I'm, I'm more and more convinced that this Fukushima is another false flag, that there isn't the type of radiation coming out of there that they claim. Maybe not even at all, I don't know. It's interesting to, to note that with all those... Um, if that were all true, how could they ignore it? The, the uncanny thing about those Illuminati cards from 15, almost 20 years ago now. You know, the Twin Towers, the biker gangs, the alien invasion, the uh, uh, New World Order, the uh, all these, these things that... Uh, and one of them is nuclear accident. It's one of the cards you get to play. So, you know, that that could all just be a farce as well, except what's interesting is that if you unwind it back to a group that do hold all the cards and they do empower nations through their money to elect the people they want to do their bidding and to kill whoever they f believe is a threat to them through hiring and through the guns and you know, at that level, if you're going to accept that the Jesuits perhaps had Albert Pike write the plan for three world wars, and that's still one that I, I struggle with. I, I, I would like to be able to explain that away as a bunch of hype, and yet son of a gun the earliest record of it is too far before world war ii to be sheer coincidence and then long too far before world war three with the muslims to be sheer coincidence not when it looked like the whole war would be with the russia all of this time that would have been a much easier one to justify to set up even today as we said Suddenly, after 20 years ago, Russia was so broke that people were starving to death. Everything had been stolen from them. Today, you look on the Internet, the hype about Russia is World War III. Their arms are superior to ours. Where in the world did they get all that? Okay, they borrowed it, right? They borrowed the money from whoever would loan. Well, first of all, they were broke, so who would loan them all that money? Where, was it? Where were they ever going to pay it back? And secondly... In a world that you're trying to have peaceful and you've spent all this money to break the Russians, why would you fund the rearming of them and how come that was never part of our very popular mainstream media over the last 20 years? Hey, wait a minute, Russia's rearming. A few people, when I think back now, there were those, but that was laughed at. Ah, ha, ha, yeah, Russia, they, they're rearming. Puh. But again, so it just happened under our nose. Our military industrial complex, all of our intelligence industry, eh, we just never really noticed that they became actually as strong or stronger than we are. At least that's the, the propaganda now. So again, when, when did that all happen? How did that all happen? It's impossible that that happened without the people who own the world, who have all the money to lose and funded the fall of the Russian Empire, if we're going to believe that, funded the fall of Nazism, and now they're just going to allow Russia to rearm. No way. So, and then why isn't the final war one on Russia? Why is it against the, the Muslims? And why is it the Muslims have in their Quran for 1400 years that it'll be the sacrifice of the Muslims that comes at the end? before their Mahdi shows up? And why is it the Jews have that at their end, they would be killed? So all of this just has so much deeper implication to it. It makes me feel, number one, that the same force has been in charge for the last hundred years and orchestrated the first two world wars, which means Russia, China, they're all getting their money from the same people. So there isn't this big threat from them. That's all part of the wag the dog. The Fukushima thing, I mean, I, you know, I didn't 
the, the, it finally dawned on me that you, something you keep saying for years, why would they hurt themselves? Why would they do anything that's going to ruin their own strategic hold on everything? And of course they wouldn't. And Fukushima, as many of the scientists who are given sheer, just simple data have pointed out, I mean, that's a planet killer. You destroy the whole ocean, you destroy the world. May not happen this year or next year, but there's you do, there are no elites left to enjoy it. You the elites have destroyed themselves. And if that were the case, then doing something about Fukushima, if it was throwing every other human body in the world at it to absorb the radiation, would be the first and foremost thing going on in the world. The elite money would be shown quite clearly to be doing something about Fukushima, just like it did about the. Look at the big oil leak in the Gulf, right? Did they, is that just still going? Heck no! Whoever had to pay for it was going to pay for it, but they were going to get somebody's going to get out there and plug that thing up because you're not going to ruin my ocean forever. See? But Fukushima, well, Japanese people—they're just lying. Oh, so that's going to be good enough for the elites of the world? Uh, well, we can't get a straight answer out of Japan. Meanwhile, what we can assume by the size of the alleged accident is that the Pacific Ocean will be dead in a couple of years and, you know, the North American continent will be dead. And, yeah, that's why all the politicians are still flying around interested in their re-election campaign because they know there's a cloud of radiation flying around North America. I say no, no way. They, the, if you, what you saw... You couldn't ignore it. Well, if what you saw was all the the people in the know, like politicians, or all flooding down to Chile and and South America to hold their conferences, suddenly nobody. If you couldn't find them coming to America to do anything except by telephone conference, well, that would be evidence. Oh, they don't want to go anywhere near America. But the fact is that they do which means that um, there isn't radiation soaking all over the place like they claim that uh, I believe Fukushima is going to turn out to be a false flag. So just by the evidence that they're not paying much attention to that, but like Dad said, they're paying a lot of attention to global warming. Uh -huh. how, mu how much time would you need to worry about global warming if Fukushima was real? <laughs> well, know? the funny part about global warming is that it is a fact. But it's a natural fact. Man has nothing to do with it. We don't put enough greenhouse gas into the air that uh, to make a dent in in the problem. Well, that's why it's chosen as the as the red herring because the science is absurd, just like 9/11. Science is absurd, but it's also um, universally adaptable and the just like terror in, book line and sink well well no nobody bought it really that's they they propagandize it 24 hours a day as if people bought it so the people on the end of their propaganda uh, make it look as if everybody believes this but the truth is that that's why they have to keep claiming it that's why the pope has to keep telling the catholics that it's real that's why they have to the pundits have to they have to keep repeating it constantly, like Ebola. They had to put signs up all over uh, Africa there where Ebola was supposedly from because the people were like, mm, there's no, you know, what do you mean Ebola? I don't know anybody with it. Just like in Mexico when the, when the swine flew, I was here when that broke out. And everybody all of a sudden wearing masks on their faces. And of course I was petrified. Oh, the swine flu. The Americans weren't coming here. It killed the whole business that year because swine flu. And when you met people that were from, you know, like the, the in the know, the hip, younger sort of, I met some people from Mexico City that worked for the government. And they were laughing about it. Eh, swine flu, that's, yeah, there's no, that's just all wag the dog stuff here. You know, and that so that made me think. Cause I thought, oh, son of a gun, I'm I'm one of the people out there m moving according to the wag the dog beat. You know, so same idea, Ebola. So the people in Africa could not be convinced that there was Ebola, so they had to go on a whole Ebola is real campaign 
put posters all up, put t-shirts on everybody. Ebola is real, you know, because the people are looking at me. When do you have to convince people, I mean, in the Black Plague, did you have to come to town and say, hey, the Black Plague is real, deniers? Yeah, well, no kidding, half the town is dying from it. You don't have to convince me that the Black Plague is real. See, but the Ebola virus, no, nobody's, no, nobody, nobody has it. We don't know what you're talking about with this Ebola virus. Ebola is real, so they got to convince everybody. See, well, it is a real disease. There's no, no question about well, that. Well, yes, actually, there but is. that's all that's <laughs> real is that it's a real disease. Yeah, well, sorry, there's even a question about that. It's a it's a man-made false flag event waiting to happen so that they can tell you what you've got and now tell you how to cure it. And there's no accident that Ebola and all these different swine flu, bird flu. All these outbreaks are happening in conjunction with a constant uh, increase in vaccination production and um, in fast-tracking these vaccinations through their normal procedures so that A, they can get that poison into you quicker on a bigger scale and B, uh, there's without the oversight and B, it's a lot cheaper. Doesn't cost nearly the money to spend 10 years getting a vaccine through when there's a public outcry and the CDC says, oh, we need to fast track this swine flu vaccine and we need lots of it, you know. So, uh, sorry, but that's too clear. How is it clear? Because the real evidence, the real people aren't behind it. The real grassroots people, like, look, for instance, let me give you a perfect example, Dad, the the bee thing, the thing with the bees, the honey bees, they're disappearing. That's a fact. How do we know? Because A, you don't see a big deal on the mainstream media. You don't see the Pope talking about it. You don't see Obama getting a Nobel Prize for it. What you do see is dozens and dozens of individual beekeepers talking about it. The people who on the ground have the facts and notice it, they're talking about it. That's how you know it's real. So if all the doctors in the country were out there going, wow, I got another you know, Ebola virus all over the place, Ebola. But no, who you have are the few mouthpieces, CDC, Surgeon General. You know, you have your usual suspects bringing you your fear-mongering false flag campaigns and what the people who watch with us should really be looking at, I think, Dad, is what I'm looking at is the preponderance of all this coming together all at one time. Mm -hmm. The Pope with his, you know, platform, the, uh, the Jews now, of course, are screaming that they're on high alert because the Iran deal, how dangerous that's made it for them. Um, the... Syrians, of course, are in a, I don't, I, I don't know if they're in a better or worse position. Assad writes, you know, Assad's on, in the, in the propaganda is congratulating Iran on, you know, coming out of this sanctions and making a deal with the West. Okay. But is that because he's, you know, officially kissing up to them? Hey, you guys, I know now you'll, because part of it was, Part of his his letter was, I know now that you know you you'll be able to do more for the just cause of the just, <laughs> which of course is Assad's regime in their eyes. Uh, or is it um, a death knell for Syria, which is what it seems to me to be, since we know that horn must be uprooted, and now this deal with Iran has assured them that uprooting Syria is not going to be the war cry to uproot Iran, like probably they're worried about, since that's Israel's job, to constantly be crying that war cry. And so Iran, under all these sanctions and everything, has been able to be safe, let's say, from that, but now out from under it, with Israel claiming what a dangerous deal and all this kind of stuff. It's not hard for the false flag thing to be set up against Iran. 
And so I'm imagining that what's gone on is Iran has has agreed to make it to the next round where Syria, they've been assured that Syria is not making it to the next round. And if they want to be part of this round with Syria, it, well, now is the time to decide. So they've decided, no, I'll go ahead and wait. Because I really believe the next round is going to take the next couple of three years. The uprooting of Syria and the civil war that comes out of it and the whole destabilization of that entire region to where the Hashemite king now is in a position or the region's in the position that he now satisfies and has satisfied all along of being this righteous king that can now that has a reason to go out there conquering and to conquer his people his Islamic faith his whole way of life is being utterly threatened by this extremism that's come out which of course he won't blame America he's on the war against terrorism uh, side he's 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 on the wag the dog side. So I'm thinking that we are a couple of years from that. Uh, but it could, you know, I don't know, Dad, it could go faster. I, I think, though, that, you know, people that are watching for a rapture are just way, they're not in the flow of it right now. The flow is, you know, Islamic State was nothing a few months ago, and now they're everywhere. Uh, Syria uh, was a couple of years ago something that we were negotiating with Assad's regime or will we be able to, you know, it was all still a talk. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, now it's, you know, he's being asked to step down. Meanwhile, ISIS is a full-grown force in the region. Meanwhile, Libya and Egypt have not become these stable bastions of democratic freedom. Remember the Arab Spring? Remember what, I, remember what I was saying? When everybody was talking about how beautiful democracy in the Arab Spring? Yet those guys are still on TV and, you know, and we're still here giving our commentary. But I'm hoping that the people that are listening to it might go back and check and see that we've been reliable. We were calling the Arab Spring for the CIA uh, maneuver that it was. We were saying that it would result in destabilization. And, and, the, and the extreme factions coming to play, like the Muslim Brotherhood that was keeping, that was what was being kept down by these different governments, that naturally that would come to play. And, and so in Libya, you can just see that's been a source for the weapons and, and all sorts of things now, um, if, you, if you knew the, all the logistics on the ground, why Libya was a logistical stronghold that had to be gotten rid of so the things coming through Africa and Egypt and stuff through uh, getting over to Syria and to other parts like Yemen could be facilitated where it couldn't uh, the, those people were the very people of course Libya was keeping down all these extremists let's call them these uh, jihadist type of faction so so this has all been let loose on purpose so when we understand that, we can start watching it through Daniel's glasses for what's coming. We know that a seven-year covenant has to come. We know that the, the false Messiah has to rise up. He's got to be given a crown as a righteous king to go conquering and to conquer. Well, that's not. we're not really ready for that just yet. The third horn has not been uprooted to make room for him. You know, I've never been understand why that makes room for him, but the Islamic eschatology points out that it creates a Sunni Shia civil war. Now that brings Iran into it even further. It brings all of these Middle East countries right into the forefront of the struggle. And now it also pits Saudi Arabia and Iran against this false messiah as the scripture trying to draw it in at this last bit to the scripture as you were saying because we know that these are the people that come against him in the end he has to go fight Saudi Arabia he has to go fight Egypt he has to go fight Iran in the end and of course those are Shia countries in the beginnings he has to fight the Sunni countries Turkey perhaps 
right? And and whatever's being established in Iraq through this ISIS uh, setup, perhaps Libya as well, he'll have to go liberate again, see? Because these are Sunni countries that have been taken over by this false Mahdi, as he's going to claim them, or this false imam, this false caliph. And that's going to provide this, the justification in their world for a true caliph uh, warring against the false caliph. But see, that's going to happen again because the true caliph doesn't come till at the time Jesus returns. Mm -hmm. See? And so this is their false setup. This is their false messiah being set up by a falser messiah, if you will. The caliph that's setting himself up now has to be taken out by the false caliph to give him the true status of the false caliph so he can be believed in. Now that see is what we're really watching for right now and i believe that we're going to see i believe we're going to see that i don't think the rapture is going to happen until we see syria fall and the false messiah uh rise up to be given this this crown to go forth conquering and to conquer we're going to at least see the prerequisite to that which means this sunni shia civil war which is already happening, but it's it's not at that stage yet where it's on the front page of the paper. And that's what I think that over this next year, we're going to see that happen. I think uh, that's what I'm looking for anyway, Dad. Yeah, well, I, I have to agree with all of that, because what I see is that uh, all of these false flag wars that ha are going to come about in this civil war, pitting... Um, one nation against another and that's what the scripture said you know nation will fight against nation and and those are the nations that they're talking about and we don't have to get involved in any of that this is all you know a, a remote war like drones we don't need pilots to drop bombs anymore we have kids sitting at video games dropping bombs so all of this is leading to that and from many, many years ago, I always said, we're in the pre, we're, we're in those prelude days, and we're going to see it right up to a certain point Then that group that is um, known as the Church of Philadelphia uh, that has a door being held open, they're going to be taken out of the way. And then the rest of this stuff is just going to happen like, you know, water busting through a dam. It's just going to run right down the canyon into the, and cover everybody. So... Uh, uh, I think we still have to pay attention to the timing on this. The red moons are still in effect. All of the stuff that that the Jews are waiting for uh, are things that are going to happen in the spring. So again, it's the springtime that we have to watch, and we know what to watch for, and we know where to watch for it in the in the Middle East. The in the springtime when the Jews are waiting for their dead to rise, and if they do. You've got that 40-day warning, and then you can count on the fact that those that are going in a rapture are going to go 40 days after those dead rise. And so that's what I have to say about it. And I think that this whole thing is moving in that direction a lot faster than it was five years ago, four years ago. And then it started to pick up three years ago, and boy, now it's just running like an uh, out-of-control freight train. And so... Uh, there you have it for this week, folks. Uh, keep your eye on what's going on. Uh, the Pope and his challenge or his bid to become the czar for taking care of the world uh, and um, developing underdeveloped countries. Boy, oh boy, that would sure be something if he did that. But all for the wrong reason. There's no reason to be worried about global warming. It's absolutely natural. And we're not contributing to it as human beings. So... Uh, keep your eyes on the Middle East, see what's happening with ISIS. Keep your eyes on the uh, who they're going to give the Nobel Prize to this coming year. It's going to be Kerry and the, and the ambassador that he did the dealing with from Iran for making this wonderful piece that's going to change the world, baloney. And like I always tell you, if this is a storehouse where you get your meat, then it's time to stand up and cheer and cheer loudly because it's offering time. You make that offering with a frankincense offering. 
And right at the top of brosal.org on the Facebook, there's a, in the right hand corner, there's a little PayPal button. Just click on that. And it take you right to the donation place. And we appreciate those offerings because they keep this word coming out to you. And until we see you again next week, for Brother, I mean, for Tony, I'm Brother Sal.